go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your journey with dogs and how you ended up with greyhounds. Yeah. Well, thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, uh, I adopt, most people get into a greyhound through adoption, through the adoption movement. And I adopted my first, uh, former racing greyhound in 1994. Uh, and, um, uh, I'd always heard about them. And my wife and I had just moved into a house that had a fenced in backyard. So we decided it was time to get a dog. And, um, I had read about greyhound adoption in the newspaper, but I had a client who was, uh, had just adopted one. And, and every time I would talk to her on the phone, she would just go on and on about how wonderful this dog was. So that kind of clinched it for me. Uh, and we explored it, looked into it, did a little research and, uh, then ended up adopting our uh, first one in 1994. I got involved with the, the group I adopted her from as a volunteer because it's a very ground adoption is a very volunteer driven, uh, movement. And, um, so the, the other thing they say about greyhounds is you can't, it's like potato chips. You can't stop with just one. So we quickly adopted, uh, uh, a second one. And, uh, my third one was, uh, I acquired as a puppy, uh, visited a greyhound farm just cause I wanted to see what was, uh, you know, what the training regimen was like, what the breeding regimens were like and so forth. And I kind of hit it off with the fellow that ran it, ended up buying a puppy from him that kind of caught my eye. Uh, she raced there in Florida and then we moved her up to the Birmingham, Alabama track. And she raced there until she began to slow down a little bit. And then she came home with us and, um, uh, we, uh, turned her into a lure courser and had a lot of fun with her in amateur sports as well as just being a pet. And then, um, uh, I joined a Greyhound club, the Southeastern Greyhound club that had, it had been a club started by uh, show Greyhound people. Uh, and, um, they had kind of let it languish. And so, uh, uh, one, one lingering, uh, surviving member decided he wanted to rebreathe, uh, new life into it with uh, getting adopters involved. So I joined it and uh, ultimately became the president of the club. Uh, we started our own Greyhound Adoption Group through the club in uh, uh, 1998, became um, Southeastern Greyhound Adoption, and we became a chapter of Greyhound Pets of America, which is a national network of Greyhound Adoption Groups. And I've just kind of gone from there. I've got, I got uh, big into uh, the sport of lure coursing, also done a little, um, uh, amateur racing with the greyhounds and we have uh, we always have a whippet or two and um and just have done a variety of other things i have the podcast greyhound nation that i host uh, with my friend michael burns and i've written a number of articles and so forth for greyhound magazines and uh and field sports magazines so um that's kind of my journey to date actually for as a pet i i just knew them first as a pet and they're very sweet and companionable biddable um, uh, easy to keep for the most part. Uh, don't bark a great deal. Uh, don't shed a great deal. They do shed some like any dog, but just all of those things, they just make a really nice, easy, low maintenance pet for the most part. Uh, and then in 19, and then I started, I went to, I went to the races a few times. I'd never been to a Greyhound race, went to a few races in Alabama at the victory land track and the, the Birmingham track and ultimately down to Florida. I uh, really enjoyed watching them run. Uh, and in 1998, I went to the Waterloo Cup in England, which is a coursing event. That's, that's where they chase the real thing over there. And that really fired my imagination for the breed because that's 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 the breed's origins. They've been coursing dogs for centuries, uh, long, long before they were racing dogs. And so that really, that I think that's probably what truly lit my fire. Before that, it was a nice interest, a nice hobby. And after I saw them coursing the hares in England, uh, that kind of got me even further into the breed. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that's in the early days of the greyhound adoption movement. That's one of the things we kind of had to educate the public about because, you know, they saw them racing with the muzzles on and are they high strung and do they need a lot of room to run and, and so forth. And so we kind of had to educate folks that, well, uh, a good brisk walk or maybe a run uh, once a day uh, in the backyard and they will sleep the rest of the time. They, they're, they're world-class sleepers and uh, they'll come in and curl up on their bed and just sleep for hours at a time. So they don't, they don't take, you know, any more exercise than any other breed. Certainly exercise is good for them. And we always encourage anybody that adopts one to make sure it gets plenty of exercise, keeps it proper weight and so forth. But uh, yeah, they're, they're easy keepers in the house for sure. 
Yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of parallels between greyhounds and thoroughbreds, and and I find that a lot of people uh, that like racing greyhounds also enjoy following horse racing or just are general horse lovers as well. So yeah, they're they're definitely two of the fastest four legged athletes. That's for sure. Well, the, the, one of the old myths about them that was perpetrated for a long time, uh, innocently, but still, uh, was that they were they had origins in the Middle East. And the, cert, certain sidehound breeds do have origins in the Middle East, Salukis, uh, Afghan hounds, that sort of thing. But uh, some genetic research done a few years ago uh, found that they were, they were actually uh, uh, originated in the regions where the Celtic people live, which is you know, the British Isles, uh, France, uh, Western Europe, that sort of thing. So that's, that's where their origins were, uh, the greyhound as we know it today. Um, and they were originally, some were used for, for hunting, uh, but those tended to be the, the rough coated variety. What we may think of today as like a Scottish deer hound. Um, the, the smooth coated greyhounds were, were used from going way back, even as far back as the first or second century AD for hair coursing. They would, they would be, uh, involved in competitions to, uh, chase hairs. Uh, and, and the Romans, uh, it's, it's believed brought the brown hair to, uh, the British Isles when they, when they occupied Britain, uh, specifically for the purpose of having something for the greyhounds to, to chase and that they could compete with and wager on and so forth. So, so hunting to some extent, uh, the rough coated variety. And then as, as they, the breeding got refined and so forth, hair coursing was the, uh, was the really original job of what we know as the modern greyhound. And as we know, the modern greyhound today, is there a big difference between, say, like the racing greyhound and the show line or pet line greyhounds? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, the, um, the racing greyhounds, of course, all descend from the coursing greyhounds. Uh, the coursing greyhounds tend, and there, and there are still coursing greyhounds in the world. There's um, uh, uh, coursing in, still in Ireland. Uh, one of the things I have a small breeding program that I'm one of my goals is try to preserve some of the English coursing bloodlines. Those dogs tended to be a little stockier than um, uh, the racing greyhounds that that were bred down from them. They they it, hair coursing is a bit more rigorous. The courses last longer than your average race. There's more turns, and so they needed to be a little stockier. I, I tell people think. Think linebacker uh, for coursers and and wide receiver for for uh, racers, but anyway, starting in the 1920s when greyhound racing came to the U.S. and to England and Ireland, uh, the, the all the racing greyhounds were bred from coursing greyhounds, and over the decades, as they they're bred more for short sprint speed and so forth, uh, they've gotten um, shall we say uh, a little bit lighter framed and so forth. Now, the big chasm has happened with respect to the showbred greyhounds. Uh, that, that started back in the 30s and 40s. They, they were all, of course, bred from, from racing or coursing uh, bloodlines, but they, they were bred for specifically for looks, not for athleticism. And so over the years, sadly enough, like so many other breeds, have, this has happened in the show world, they've become kind of exaggerated. They have very long necks. Uh, they tend to be slab sided. Their chests often, uh, you know, extend beyond below their elbows and so forth. So they're just kind of more, um, uh, they tend to be bigger than even racing greyhounds or coursing greyhounds. And they're just, uh, they're, they're almost a different breed. Uh, I hear people mistake them sometimes for Great Danes and so forth, but uh, they've almost become, sadly enough, uh, a different breed. And so it, would that go along with the breed clubs? Is there any, is there a division between the breed clubs? Yeah, there's, well, there's actually only the, all the breed clubs uh, tend to be uh, uh, made up of show breeders. For example, the Greyhound Club of America, that's the only uh, national Greyhound club uh, in, in the U S and it's almost exclusively uh, people who breed greyhounds for the show ring. So the, the, there haven't really been other um, specifically breed specific clubs like our our club is a regional club, uh, and we're all greyhounds, and almost everybody in our club has 
uh, racing or uh, coursing bred greyhounds. Um, so they, there hasn't been a division among the club, the, the national clubs, because here or, or in England or Ireland, the greyhound clubs there are almost entirely uh, show breeders and show people who show their greyhounds. And can you describe a, a, a proper um, racing or coursing uh, greyhound and um, how that differs from the, the national breed club standards? Well, oddly enough, the if you read the, the for example, the American written standard, I, I think one thing we have to go back to is the fact that greyhounds historically were not bred to a written standard. They were bred to a performance standard. So nobody had a piece of paper with with breed descriptions on it. And they said, oh, let's breed to, to this, what this says on this paper. So they weren't really bred with any particular, um, uh, they were bred for function. They were bred for whatever structure, uh, you know, would give them the highest athletic performance. And, and you know, it's the classic uh, uh, form follows function. Um, but um, the, the oddly enough, the written standard that the uh, uh, Greyhound Club of America promulgated it's a little vague, it's a little subjective, but it actually fairly written, fairly read, uh, describes a, a, a well-built uh, coursing type greyhound. Unfortunately, the show breeders don't really follow that written. They tout it, they say we're breeding to the standard, but if you if you hold up a picture of the typical showbred greyhound and compare it to that writing, um, it doesn't, uh, there's not much similarity. I always say that um, there's so many historical photographs of high achieving greyhounds, both racing and coursing, that they really ought to substitute these pictures, these photographs for the written standard, because, you know, you point to that, this dog and say, breed a greyhound that looks like that, and you'll be breeding a proper greyhound. Of course, I'm, I'm kind of a voice in the wilderness on that. Um, not many people um, uh, in the show world have any, have much, seem to have much interest in doing that. But basically, you know, they're sprinters. They're, they should be lean, uh, they, they're, they're short coated, of course, uh, they should be muscular. Uh, everything about them should say, uh, fast, agile, athletic. Uh, and, um, uh, so that's kind of a, the, the, that's the best description. I think you can, you can choose for it. that and, and, you know, get, get down the picture book and look at all the photographs of the great historical greyhounds. And that'll tell you what one looks, should look like. Is there a difference in uh, uh, temperament uh, between the show lines and, and the racing lines? Um, you know, I don't have enough experience with, with show bred greyhounds to really have an educated opinion. I will say I've been to some lure coursing events where some show bred greyhounds came out and I personally found the show breads to be a little more uh, standoffish, a little, little loud, little, have a little more voice when somebody walked past a, a crate or a car they were in, they'd bark at them and so forth. It, and it's, it's possibly because, um, racing greyhounds, race bred greyhounds have been around a lot. They've been socialized from day one, they've traveled, uh, and so forth. And, and they've been in a colony of greyhounds in the racing kennel. So they kind of have to get along with everybody, you know, and, um, uh, and they do. I mean, the ones that are, don't get along or that are fighters on the track, as they as they call it, they won't get bred on for the most part. Um, and so through those decades of breeding for those particular temperaments, uh, you know, I think personally, I think the racing and the coursing bred greyhounds are a little bit more mellow, a little more laid back. There's two tracks left in West Virginia. And those are the only two. Now, that's in the United States. It's uh, greyhound racing is thriving in in Ireland, England, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, the big problem was um, uh, it depends on who you talk to, but um, in my opinion is in in America, the greyhound racing community did not do a great job a with managing a good public image, and b effectively countering and making their case to the public, effectively countering the anti-racing factions, the animal rights folks, and making their case to the public. They kind of made themselves low-hanging fruit, and the animal rights folks picked them, basically. I mean, if you wanted to wrap it up in, in one sentence, that's, that's kind of the way it was. And um, uh, the other racing communities in the other countries, they've kind of gotten the message. They understand what they have to do to maintain a positive uh, uh, public image and to have, you know, what's come to be called the social license, 
because anybody that has anything to do with animal sports knows if you don't have the social license, you may not be around for a long time. And that just means basically general acceptance by the public that the people who are dealing with the animals in animal sports or animal entertainment, you know, are doing right by the dogs, treating them well, breeding them well, and so forth. And um, uh, that's kind of what happened in the U.S. They just kind of basically lost their their social license. What, did everybody just switch to lure coursing or was it? No. And just- in, in fact, most of the racing people have not really gotten involved in amateur sports. Uh, they just went out, of, they, they stopped breeding. They, they, uh, those that maybe had kennels in Florida in the Florida tracks, you know, which was really the, the, the biggest state on greyhound racing in in the country, they just went into another business. Um, I've got a friend that was a racing breeder and, uh, he's now raising cattle, for example, on his farm. Um, and so, um, yeah, the breeding numbers, the, the the American race bred breeding numbers are are well down now. They're, I think they're probably for 2023. Uh, they haven't published the final numbers yet, but I think it'll probably be below 1,000 individuals, individual dogs that were bred. Now, the good news is the breeding numbers are continuing on in, in the, those other countries I mentioned. So they're, they're continuing on. And Hopefully they'll mix some of the American bloodlines into their Irish, English, uh, Australian and New Zealand bloodlines. Cause the American racing bloodlines are really quite good. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I've, um, from several people that, that are in the know about it, that the American lines were always kind of, um, the sought after lines at one point in time or another. Yeah, what absolutely. Did, and, um, Outside of the British Isles, is there anybody anywhere else that's uh, uh, have a burgeoning greyhound uh, population? Well, there's you know there's some greyhound breeding in Europe. Uh, Germany, for example, has a big amateur racing community. They 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 even have some municipalities that maintain a, a track in in part of their um, uh, their their city park or their county park or or whatever. Uh, now this is a strictly amateur sport. There's there's no significant money involved. There's no wagering. It's just done for you know the fun of of taking your dogs out and maybe winning a trophy and watching them race and that sort of thing. So there is a small amateur community there. We we've got a a pretty nice amateur racing community here in the U.S. that kind of exists co- alongside uh, lure coursing. Uh, and so. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of breeding going on in Australia, for example, and and Ireland. Probably more breeding in Ireland than England. A lot of the Irish breeders will sell their greyhounds that they they breed to um, uh, owners in uh, uh, in uh, in England. So a lot of the English racing involves Irish bred greyhounds. Is there uh, been a lot of um, sharing of bloodlines be- between? the U S and the UK some more the other way. I mean, there, there was a, um, a gentleman back in the, in the seventies, eighties, et cetera, named, uh, uh, Pat Dalton, Irishman, uh, kind of a pioneer in bringing Irish greyhounds over to the United States to race over here and then to be bred. So it's, it's been more Irish being brought over here, uh, to be bred to than the other way around. But, um, right now, you know, with, there's lots of frozen semen in vials sitting in, 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 um, storage facilities. Uh, and we hope that, you know, the people won't get tired of paying the, the storage fees for the semen and, and that those vials of semen will continue to be available for those worldwide that want to use them for breeding. Yeah. With these new CDC laws, uh, coming about in August, I don't know fully what's going on, but I hear it's going to be, that much more difficult to, uh, to get dogs over, over here. Yeah. You definitely have to jump, jump through more hoops for sure. Uh, let's talk about lure coursing. What, uh, what entails with lure coursing and, and, and how did that, uh, how did that, you know, catch your passion? Lure coursing is a sport that is intended to simulate coursing. Uh, a lot of people call lure coursing coursing. It's pet peeve of mine that you don't distinguish. It's important to distinguish the two. Coursing is the pursuit of live game. Lure coursing is the pursuit of an artificial lure. It was started back in the in the seventies by some folks out in the western states who um, uh, 
who were coursing people, not just greyhound people, but but other sighthound people, uh, and they wanted to have something their dogs could participate in in the off season because they don't they don't run the hares in the western states year round. It gets too hot. They don't want to get into the hare breeding season, et cetera. So they developed lure coursing as a um, kind of a substitute for that. And it also takes less land. You know, you can you can do it on a on a ten to fifteen acre field, uh, whereas with hair coursing, you have to have wide expanses of of land where the where the hares live. Uh, and so uh, it came along the, in in the uh, an organization called the American Sighthound Field Association uh, was formed, and they they were the for years they were the sanctioning uh, body of uh, for for all lure coursing. I took my first Greyhound lure coursing in, in 90, 1995 to a local club. It's a club hosted sport, uh, strictly amateur, uh, no money involved. Um, and, and various clubs would be formed to host lure coursing trials, typically weekend, typically, you know, the two days of the weekend, it's a weekend sport. Uh, and so I took, I took, uh, my first Greyhound brandy to, a lure coursing trial and just let her, they have a, they'll offer often after the competition, they'll offer what they call a fun run or a practice run. And I let her have a go at that. And it was just amazing. I had never, you know, she'd run in our backyard and I'd seen a little, gotten a little taste of it back there. But, but once you've seen them, you know, out running in the open, uh, in full pursuit of the lure, it, it really, uh, it really kind of lights your fire. And she was actually pretty good. She, she was not, she was a very average racer, but she was quite a, a, a an accomplished, uh, lure courser. And, um, uh, so that I just got started in that our club started our own lure coursing program in 1996. Uh, I served on the board of ASFA for a couple of terms in the early two thousands. And I've just been involved in, in the sport. It's kind of my, Greyhound sport of choice. Uh, uh, I, I like the amateur racing, but I, I like lure coursing even better. So I'm still doing that. Our club holds four four weekends of trials uh, every every season. We our season is November to March. It gets too hot here in the southeast to to run the dogs. You know, starting about uh, late late March, early April, and then uh, we pick back up again in uh, in November. What makes a, a good lure coursing um, greyhound? Um, well, the, the, they're judged on, in, in asphalt lure coursing, they're judged on five, it's a kind of subjective judging, they're judged on five categories, and the categories are weighted. The, the he, most heavily weighted um, uh, categories are speed and agility. So it's not just speed, it's not who comes in at the end of the course first, the way racing is, you know, first over the finish line. Um, and so, um, it's how they have to be able to show agility as well as speed. And of course, to show agility, you can only show it at speed. You can't, you, you know, a fat man can look real agile running and making a sharp turn if he's going slow, but if you're going fast, that takes some real talent to modulate your speed just enough to make the, the to make the turn well. So lure coursing has the, the sharper turns than racing oval racing or straight racing has. And so that's what it takes. It's speed and agility. They have to be quite fit to, you know, the, the typical course is seven to 900 yards uh, and they run twice at least during a, a day's competition. So they have to have good stamina. Uh, they have to be fit uh, and, uh, you know, they have to be able to, to bounce back from that second run and, and be ready to go on the, I mean, on the first run and go, go on the second. So in, in Greyhounds, um, it's, it's basically speed, agility, and endurance that those are the three big, uh, and of course, obviously they have to have a certain keenness for the lure. Um, and most of them do, I mean, they, they'll, they'll, they love to chase anything, uh, moving swiftly across the ground, whether it has fur or whether it's just a plastic bag. Probably the biggest, um, health issue, uh, for the racing bred greyhounds and, and there's some, well, I'll get into that in a minute, but it's osteosarcoma, bo bone cancer. Um, and uh, it's not very present in the, in the show lines. They tend to have, their, their problems tend to be uh, uh, gastric torsion, bloat. Uh, they don't have a lot of it, but they have more of it than the racing bred greyhounds. And there's different theories on why that is. But anyway, back to the racing bred, um, uh, there's been some, there's a really pretty persuasive, at least persuasive to me, uh, scientific evidence in say the last 10 years or so 
that for for breeds large breed dogs that are already prone genetically to uh, cancers, particularly osteosarcoma, and that that osteosarcoma affects large breeds more than it affects any other you know uh, segment of or sizes of breeds. So that where they're already genetically kind of predisposed to have, be at risk of it. Uh, having them spayed or neutered in the traditional faction where they're, you know, where the testicles are removed or the ovaries in the uterus are removed tends to place them at higher risk of developing osteosarcoma, particularly in midlife, you know, in the ages of say seven to 10. Um, and that one of the reasons why the show bred greyhounds may not have, um, such a high incident of, of it is that, um, they tend to be intact. They tend to be kept intact because they, ha they have to be intact to, to participate in the, in the show ring. Um, so I, I got, I lost like three or four greyhounds in a short period of time in their midlife to osteosarcoma. And I had a friend tell me about these studies that had been done. So I really delved deep into it and it convinced me from, from that point forward, unless the individual dog's health needs dictated that they be spayed or neutered like a female getting pyometra or something like that. I wasn't, I was going to leave all my, my greyhounds intact going forward, which I've done. And the, my, my incidence of osteosarcoma in my greyhounds just plummeted. Uh, you talk to breeders that have mostly intact, I mean, racing and coursing breeders that have mostly intact greyhounds and they don't have a great high incidence of, of osteosarcoma. So there's, there's some developing evidence that if we, you know, every, almost every adopted racing greyhound is spayed or neutered before they get to the adopter. Uh, and so it's, it's 99.5% or so of, of adopted greyhounds are, um, uh, are spayed or neutered. And so, and, and that's the, that's the breed segment that tends to have the higher, uh, rates of osteosarcoma. So there's, there's some pretty good evidence I think that's developing and it's going to continue to develop that, um, th that the, the high incidence of spay or neuter in any particular breed may be a contributing factor to the, the risk of osteosarcoma. So that's, that's the number one, um, uh, uh, breed probably disease for which they're at risk. Uh, there's more minor ones, uh, like panis, for example, there's some, there's some lines that tend to have more panis than others that's easily treatable. So that's not a big problem. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, through, because of the way they've been bred, uh, hip dysplasia, for example, is almost non-existent in, in racing and in coursing bred greyhounds. Um, and so, um, other than, uh, other than a couple of those cancers, uh, osteosarcoma, occasionally hermangiosarcoma, uh, there's no real breed specific, uh, diseases in the racing and coursing bred greyhounds. And what would you say with the, the, the bone cancer is just cause they have a, a leaner, finer bone. Is that part of the issue? It, it, they think that it has to do with the, you know, it, it often occurs in the long bones and obviously taller, larger breeds have longer, long bones, femur, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, um, so that's one theory. They don't really, they, they're not really sure. I don't think why, why the larger breeds tend to have a, have more of it. I mean, for example, Doberman, I mean, um, Rottweilers have a slightly higher incidence of osteosarcoma than, than, uh, than greyhounds. And they're obviously, they're not as tall as greyhounds are. So, but it just tends to be a large breed thing. I don't have particular height or weight, um, you know, that I'm breeding to, I'm trying to breed to, um, the typical, I, I'm breeding from a lot of, uh, English open coursing, bloodlines. And like I said, they tend to be stockier. Uh, the males are, but, but they're not huge. Uh, I think to some extent, uh, we've gotten greyhounds a little big. Uh, I like to keep the males in the mid seventies and the females in the mid fifties. You know, that's kind of my optimum uh, pounds is my optimum size. Um, uh, they do better in amateur sports that I think they hold up better, uh, in robust athletic competitions. And, um, uh, that's, that's another difference between, um, the racing bread and the coursing bread and the show bread, the show bread tend to be, it's not unusual to have 90, 95 pound males in the show breads. Also in the, in the park coursing, in closed coursing in Ireland, 
those dogs are bred for just pretty much straight ahead blazing speed and they're tending to breed them in my opinion a little big that you it's not unusual to get a a park coursing irish bred greyhound you know in the in the low to mid 90s uh in, in the males um but i'm looking to breed i like to breed classically sized uh what i call classically sized greyhounds you look back there's a great website called greyhound data uh that has pedigrees on it and and it goes back to the greyhounds in the 1800s and with each listing of each dog for a lot of them they list the weights and for example uh fullerton uh who's this considered by many greyhound historians to be the greatest greyhound who ever lived because he won the waterloo cup four times which is unheard of uh he was the secretariat you might say of of greyhounds he weighed 66 pounds so you know uh, and he wasn't considered small in his day uh so to me that's what what we ought to go for in our breed to kind of keep them true to their historical legacy is keep them in that moderate kind of size range, like I say, 70s, mid to low 70s for the males, uh, mid 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 50s, maybe maybe even low 60s for some females. But I think that's the that's what I shoot for when we breed. They they don't tend to have you know stru skeletal structural problems uh, to any extent. Uh, toes, I'll talk a little bit. Those are the bane of of most greyhound people's existence. It's not that they have weak toes. It's just that they have long, they tend to have long toes and turning even on the racetrack, even as gentle as the ovals there, uh, can dislocate a toe. And so every, almost anybody that's ever been involved in either professional racing or amateur sports with greyhounds, or even letting them run in the backyard, uh, will dislocate a toe every now and then. Again, an easily fixable problem for the most part. But um, if they had a, if they had a structurally skeletal a uh, weak point, uh, Achilles' heel, you might say, Achilles' tendon. Um, it it would might be that uh, those toes. Is there anything you guys can do about it? Like tape them up, like you? <laughs> well, if they've if they've had an injury, people will sometimes tape the the injured one to uh, its its mate next to it, and and that can help for sure. Uh, and um, uh, you know that that's doable, but prophylactically, you know, preemptively doing it, I don't think has really been proven to make a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. they're, they're different. You know, there's cat feet and there's hair feet in greyhounds and, and there's some, you know, things in between. Tightly knuckled uh, toes are generally favored as being less per, less susceptible to dislocations or fractures. Um, I, I don't think anybody's ever done a study on that, but that kind of has tended to be the the conventional wisdom that that tightly knuckled uh, uh, feet are better than flatter toes. And of course you want big feet. When If I ever pick out a puppy somewhere, I want one with big feet um, because that's just a better platform uh, for the dog to run on. You know, the old horseman saying is no hoof, no horse. And um, uh, it's kind of true in, in, in the same way for, for greyhounds. You want a big, nice, generously proportioned foot. You know, moderate size, leanness, muscular. Um, uh, you, you don't want like a too long a neck, for example, that we see in the showbred greyhounds. Uh, you know, you want them to be able to make those turns. Uh, and, and part of it, of course, is also there's a there's a mental component too, especially in racing where they're racing eight or six dogs on the track. You've got to have a greyhound that's got the uh, courage, gumption, whatever you may want to call it, if they get if they need to push through the crowd to get to the fur to the front and they have that competitive nature, they want to get to the front. They want to be closest to the lure. Uh, then, then it takes some, uh, they call it track craft, the, uh, the ability to either push through or, you know, get, get on the outside and then come back in, find a hole in, in the traffic, so to speak, and, and, and thread that needle. So there's, there's that mental aspect as well. But, um, you know, I think just as far as the uh, the structural aspect of it, I just think, you know, uh, moderately sized, nice, big, generous, generous, generously proportioned feet and just in great condition, you know, good, good muscle condition and so forth. The females tend to hold their own on the um, uh, on the racetrack, uh, unlike, you know, in, in horse racing, you know, the Colts tend to do a little be a little faster than the Phillies. But that's not that's not always the case. I had a I had an adopted uh, uh, 
a racing greyhound. She raced at 48 pounds, so she was a small female, but she was tough as nails on the track. She she would push through the big boys and didn't mind being bumped or anything. Uh, so um, yeah, they're they're they seem to do uh, pretty well. They don't, for example, in racing they don't separate. They don't have male races, female races like they have Colts and Philly racing and in um in horse racing they they all tend to race together same in lure coursing same in amateur racing uh some people feel like in in lure coursing uh the smaller females do a little better because they're a little bit more agile uh that that's true to some extent i've had i had a great big old coursing uh uh bred greyhound that i brought over from england he was he he lure course at 85 pounds and he could turn like a whippet uh, and so you do get those atypical outliers every now and then, but, but a lot of people feel like the smaller females are the more desirable ones for, uh, for lure coursing. I'm looking for the builds that I think of as the coursing that, that remind me of a coursing bred gray. I'm a little stockier. Um, I'm looking for one that gets along with everybody. Well, I'm looking for one that, um, doesn't kind of push others around when they're out free running together. Uh, or if we, we, we don't run them on the lure much as young puppies, we, we do put a, a lunge whip out there with a bag on the end and let them, you know, kind of gauge their keenness. That's another thing obviously is, is lure keenness. Um, you want them to just, just almost run through a wall to, to be, to be able to chase the lure. And so you look for that. I always look for that as well, but you know, personality is important for us because ours are, ours are pets as well as amateur competitors. And, um, uh, but that build, that classic size, the coursing build, that's what I look for. Is there any other activities besides coursing that you've been involved in? And what was that like? Um, I haven't, I, I've done, um, I've done some amateur racing. There's two types of amateur racing for sidehounds. One is called Legra, Large Gaze Hound Racing Association. That's straight racing, uh, 250 yards, typically two, 200, 200 to 250 yards. And then there's amateur racing, I mean, uh, oval racing, which is done on a uh, either complete oval or what they call a uval, which is more of a U-shaped uh, racing. I've done a little of that. Um, some people, I have never done agility, uh, but I, some of our puppy homes have taken their greyhounds out and done agility, and they've all done done rather well. You know, it's a sport that's dominated by some of the smaller herding breeds, border collies and so forth, but uh, they've, I've had some of our puppy homes take their the greyhounds of our breeding out to do agility and they've, they've done really well. And then of course there's what we in America call open field coursing, which is hair coursing in the Western States where the jackrabbit lives, even though it's called the jackrabbit, the jackrabbit is not a rabbit, it's a hare. And there's differences in hares and rabbits in terms of how they, uh, how they run the sizes and so forth. So there's some of that. I've had some of my breeding uh, do um, open field coursing out in California, Wyoming, Texas, out in the, in the Western States where the, uh, where the jackrabbit lives. Uh, I've seen a, a few do some dock diving. They're pretty uh, yes. successful at that too. Yeah. I've got a friend who's in Oregon uh, and she's got a greyhound that's doing quite well in um in, in dock diving. That's, that's becoming an ever popular, uh, sport, uh, for people who, especially for people who get their greyhounds as, uh, as you know, puppies, because you can really get, you can instill that love of the water in them, uh, early on. And so, it's, you know, and it's low impact, you know, it's, it's, it's almost injury free. Uh, and so, yeah, that dock diving is becoming a very popular, uh, uh, amateur sport for, for greyhound folks. Uh, talk about your, your, your puppy buyers. What, what makes a good greyhound, a prospective greyhound puppy owner? Um, somebody that really kind of values, you know, I look for people that, that is interested in the legacy and the history of the breed values, the breed for what it is, for its longstanding, uh, history, uh, and, and so forth. I like to find homes that will commit to, uh, taking their puppies out once they become an adult to compete with them. Because as a breeder, you know, we don't know whether we're maintaining the athleticism of the breed unless they're tested. And the only way to test them is to, to get them out and compete in sports. Uh, so I, I, I'll 
I'll sell a puppy to somebody that doesn't want to make that commitment, but I give priority to the people that will make that commitment once we come down to things like pick order and that sort of thing. So that's what I'm looking for. Somebody that really value the dog for what he is, what he stands for, uh, that's willing to, uh, you know, take him out to, to be tested. But I, I want all of them to have a, an active lifestyle. I don't want anybody that, you know, um, just considers them as couch potatoes only and, and, you know, it values more than anything else. They're kind of houndish, uh, sleep 18 hour a day nature. I really want our puppies to have really rich, full lives, whether it's competing or doing something else, you know, traveling with their owners, getting out, uh, and, and, and engaging in, in various activities and so forth. So I want somebody who's really doing really engage their puppy throughout its life. Mm -hmm. they, they actually do quite well. Uh, there's really no inherent, um, uh, problems in, in them giving birth. Uh, most of the mothers are even, uh, you know, a lot of my mothers have been first time mothers and they've all whelped text in textbook fashion. Uh, no trouble, you know, um, during the pregnancy, no, no trouble during the, um, uh, during the, uh, whelping process, they deplete calcium a lot. Uh, and so we give them calcium supplements, you know, ahead of time and make sure we're usually during the whelping process and we'll feed them a bowl of ice cream or something to make sure they keep their calcium boosted. And, and then our reproductive vet lives, uh, gives us injectable calcium. If they, if they start to slow down, uh, that kind of helps the contractions come along. But as far as the whelping goes, uh, they're amazingly trouble-free. That's a good question. I, 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 I tend to hope that, um, they'll, they'll stay as popular as they are. They, they remain popular. I'll, I'll, we haven't talked about adoption a great deal, but, but they remain so popular that when racing was down to two tracks and there just weren't enough greyhounds to be adopted, the demand stayed strong. Most adoption groups reported that they had at any given time, you know, 15 or 20 approved applications just waiting. And so the, the Irish folks and the Australian folks, and now the New Zealand folks have gotten wind of that. And we're a great oasis. They have more greyhounds than they have homes over there for the most part, because they, obviously they're smaller, populated countries. And so we're, we're now bringing over, uh, Irish, Australian, and, uh, uh, now re most recently New Zealand greyhounds to be, to be adopted here in the U S and the demand has, has remained strong. We've had to educate people. A lot of people that had greyhounds thought, well, that this is my last greyhound. There's no more greyhounds. And they did not, they had not heard about these international programs, which have just started up in the last two or three years. Uh, and so we're trying to have to educate the, re-educate the public. No, there are greyhounds available. You don't have to wait forever. Uh, the line is not terribly long. So put your application in and, and we'll, uh, we'll get a greyhound for you. Um, I'm hoping that there'll be more and more people. Um, I'd like to see more people, uh, decide they want to, as part of their greyhounds CV, so to speak, they want to rear a puppy because I think there's a lot of benefits to that. That would help us support our hobby breeders here in the U.S., especially the ones that are breeding from the American bloodlines, because the the American racing bloodlines it may fall to these hobby breeders to keep those those bloodlines going, especially if the two tracks in in um, uh, West Virginia end up closing, and that's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, and, and so um, I'm hoping that more and more, and, and it is happening, that more and more people who started out as adopters will decide. Um, you know, I think I, I want my next greyhound. I want to rear a puppy. I want to get a, a puppy from, from racing or coursing bloodlines and they'll contact a hobby breeder. There's more and more hobby breeders coming up and, and almost all of them are quite responsible. And there's a lot of fear that the popularity of greyhounds as pets would lead to the development of, of the so-called backyard breeders. Uh, and that really has not, has not come to fruition to any extent. Um, most of the people that have decided they wanted to become a hobby breeder and breed from the American bloodlines are, are pretty responsible folks. So, um, I, I'm hoping that that community can maintain the, the American bloodlines that, and, and the people in Ireland and Australia and, uh, uh England and New Zealand who decide to breed from the, the American lines. I hear that from puppy homes. I always ask people, you know, why, why do you want a greyhound puppy? Uh, especially if they've been adopters, why don't, why don't you want to just get another adult? And, and you get various reasons, but among them are, I want to have, I want to have the puppy longer. 
uh, you know, um, if you get adopted racing greyhound at say age four or five, if you're lucky, you'll have that dog, you know, seven, six, seven years. The typical lifespan is 12 to 14. And so a lot of people say, I, I want to have, I want to have the, the dog in my life for a longer time, or I want to mold the, it more. I, you know, greyhound, the racing grounds are great because they come to you as a finished product. And so there's some people that say, I want to put my own mold onto this, onto a puppy. And just, I want to have the fun of watching them grow and develop because it is, you know, watching, watching a athletic dog learn to use their body as they mature is an, is a very fascinating process. And a lot of people cite that as a reason to, to have a puppy. I made a point of whenever I was at the track of going down and standing at the rail. I mean, you can, you know, it's not like you hear uh, uh, during a horse race. It's not quite to that volume, but you can definitely hear them pounding down that, uh, that track as they come blasting out of the starting box and then, uh, you know, down in front of the crowd in the, in the front straightway. So yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think I don't see much of that. Uh, unfortunately, they seem to be focused on what wins in the show ring and, and, you know, you'll have people take, racing former racing greyhounds especially if they can get one that's intact because that's you know as you know you have to have them intact to compete in the show ring and they'll take them to compete to see how they do and they almost always come away disappointed because the judges you know the most of these judges have never seen a greyhound race or lure course or course in their lives and they're poodle breeders or cocker breeders or whatever and and they don't know what they're looking at in terms of what how structure translates to athletic excellence and so, um, for all those reasons, the show breeders don't seem to have much, uh, interest in breeding, you know, uh, racing lines or coursing lines into their, into their bloodlines. Lord knows they're available and they're available relatively inexpensively, but you just don't see, you see almost no one breeding uh, a showbred, uh, female to a, a, a racing, uh, male at all. So I think the division will, will continue. Uh, there is no, there is no color in the standard. I mean, there's no preferred preferred color. Uh, the, the old greyhound man saying is no, a, gr a good greyhound can't be a bad color. And, um, uh, but for a time, especially in the show world, you, you tended to see a lot of, um, um, what, what they call party color, what the racing and coursing people call spotted or, or colored, uh, you know, white and fawn party color, maybe white and brindle party color, that sort of thing. I don't see that quite as much these days. Uh, but um, yeah, there's no, there's no, and, and in fact, in, in our world, in the hobby breeding world, people that breed primarily for color are kind of looked down upon as, you know, that's not a, that, that's a superficial trait to breed a greyhound for. Uh, so, you know, and, and it tends to be, you know, they'll charge more for a, say a blue greyhound or a, uh, one that's, you know, rare has, a, is a rare color. Uh, that's kind of frowned upon in the greyhound world. Uh, so yeah, there's color is not really a, a big deal in, and thank goodness for that in the greyhound world. The most at, fun part of it is when you're breeding two of them just to do, I don't know much about color genetics, but I have friends that do. So I'll say, okay, here's, here's our next breeding. What, what are we likely to get? And it's just fun to kind of throw that around. It doesn't really matter who cares what, what co color the puppies are when they come out. Uh, in my last litter, for example, um, I had two almost all black, there's a litter of three, uh, two almost all black puppies, a little white blaze, maybe white feet. And then the other, the third puppy was uh, all white, except for he had, sp he had spotted ears. And so, um, you know, that's always, that's kind of the fun part of the whelping process. What colors are you going to, you going to see come out? Uh, right now in Ireland, for example, um, and it's just happenstance because the faster dogs for, for the last few years tend to have been black. So a lot of the Irish greyhounds that we get over here for adoption are black. And we like to paraphrase Henry Ford's old saying, you know, he said you could have any color car as long as it's black. Well, we say you can have any Irish greyhound you want as long as any color Irish greyhound you want as long as it's black. They're certainly not breeding according to color. They're breeding according to athletic ability. And it just so happens that right now, uh, the black greyhounds tend to dominate in that, in that area. I yeah. love the black ones. There's a, yeah. there, you know, and the, there was a thing, there was kind of a knock on black greyhounds for a long time in the adoption world that they were harder to, to place. And, and we really haven't found that to be 
to be true. And um, uh, we don't, and, and I don't think it's true for, for the adoption community in general anymore. Um, and I never did understand it because I, to me, the, the black ones were some of the most handsome, elegant looking greyhounds that there were. Yeah, most definitely. So you, you say you also have a couple of whippets. Is that, is that yeah. true? Yeah, we we've uh, uh, we've always enjoyed having a couple of whippets around. They're they're kind of low maintenance greyhounds, you might say. Well, low maintenance in terms of the athletic, they don't they don't uh, their injury rate is much lower than than greyhounds. Not that greyhounds are high, but you, whippets are kind of I call them wash and wear. You know, they can run all day. Uh, you, they don't they don't require as much intense rest between courses of a lure coursing day. And they're, you know, they're kind of like small greyhounds in a lot of ways. Now, as you know, the the gray the whippet was originally created by crossbreeding greyhounds to various terrier breeds. So that terrier DNA is still back there, and they tend to be whippets tend to be a little yappier. Uh, we've got a puppy right now that's going to turn a year old in um, in uh, about three weeks, and he has got an incredible mouth on him, you know, but he's fast. And I, I always tell him when, he, when we get out in lure coursing, you know, you better be fast, buddy, because I've had to put up with your annoying bark all this time. <laughs> but yeah, there uh, we always we, we tend to have one or two all the time. Have you ever uh, uh, had an Italian greyhound? No, no, never have. I've been around them. Uh, I've seen seen a goodly number of them um, uh, in lure coursing. Uh, there. <laughs> That was kind of an interesting process that, you know, the, the old knock on Italian greyhounds is they break their legs every time they jump off a couch. And, uh, and there was a group of greyhound, uh, Italian greyhound enthusiasts that wanted to get Italian greyhounds admitted to the sport of lure coursing. Uh, and, uh, you know, the knock on them was, oh, it's, it's too robust for them. It's too rigorous. They'll break their legs, et cetera. Well, they worked hard and got them admitted to the sport. And it turns out that Italian greyhounds, had some of the lowest injury rates of all the sighthound breeds as frail looking as they are. Uh, yeah. they just didn't tend to get hurt very much. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I yeah, I love all three of the, the, the versions, the, they just, I've never met one that I had that I dislike. So, yep. Well, is there anything that, that we, uh, didn't convey that, that you'd like to share an hour? Sure. I mean, I, uh, I would say, uh, uh, if you, if, if your listeners are interested in, um, uh, having a greyhound in their lives, you know, I, I think the, uh, one of the best places to start is adopting a, a former racing greyhound. Uh, that's a great way to kind of get into ease into the, the breed. You might say, I'm not discouraging anybody from getting a puppy. I've, I've sold puppies to people that had never owned a greyhound before and they, they made a great home for the dog. But, um, uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, if you hear friends say, Oh, you can't adopt racing greyhounds anymore. All the tracks are closed and so forth. That's not the case. Uh, so, um, just, you know, uh, look, Google greyhound adoption in, in, in your area. And a lot of times, uh, the local groups, most, most adopt, greyhound adoption groups have, uh, a, a face, I mean, either a Facebook page or often more often than not a website and those websites will, will come up. Uh, so yeah, think about if you're interested in the breed, uh, a great way to kind of ease into your first greyhound is to adopt a, a former racing greyhound and you can get them fairly young. Yeah. You know, there's some of them that we've placed that come over and they're 18 months, two years old. Uh, so yeah, think about, give that, give that a special thought. If you, if you think you might be interested in a greyhound. Yeah, for sure. And you can, uh, still compete in. Yeah, in some, absolutely. Some sports. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people do with, with, uh, with former racing greyhound, there's any number of them that are involved in lure coursing or amateur racing or agility. Uh, some of the more minor sports like barn hunt, I see greyhounds out in that dock diving that you mentioned. So yeah, they, they're, they're most of the ones that are available for adoption are still you know, you hear them called retired. And the only thing they're really retired from is professional racing. They still got a lot of spunk and, and athleticism left in them that doesn't require top speed. They're more than happy to do and, and makes a great life for them. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. And uh, I love the breed and love hearing about them. And maybe in the near future, we can do a part two when I get some questions out of people after they listen to this one. That'd be great. I'd really enjoy it.
Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right.